Thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, distributed verifiers, interactive proofs, and zero knowledge. And this is joint work with uh, Mirav Parter and Elon Yogev. And if you have any tough questions, you can always address them to uh, Elon. And maybe we'll get to more recent work with Hila, who is also here. Uh, so interactive proofs, we all know and love interactive proofs. So in an interactive proof, there is an X and the prover who wants to convince a verifier that X is in the language. And we want completeness. If X is in the language with high probability, the verifier accepts. If X is not in the language, then with high probability, the verifier rejects. And of course, Interactive proofs led to exciting notions, exciting results, PCP, zero knowledge proofs, IP equals P space, lots of other uh, results that really define our field. So uh, why you, why are we, when do we use an interactive proof? Why use an interactive proof? Whenever the verifier is somehow weaker than the prover, right? Either computationally or maybe the Prover knows a secret or something like that. In this talk, we will consider the case where the verifier is a distributed system. So the verifier itself is distributed, not, and does not know the verifier itself and the input itself is not known to all the verifiers. So each piece of the input is known locally, not known in a global manner. Uh, so why are we interested in uh, such proofs? Well, when, if we think of the system as really being the prover, that would, could be one motivation. So it's really, I mean, before I said it's more powerful, but think of it that the system wants to prove to itself that it's in a good state, for instance. And the, then the verifier locally, you, should, uh, you, you want to be very efficient. And the prover should also be efficient, of course, because it's something you actually want to execute and but you have perhaps more time and you're doing it once and then using it many times. And there are some systems uh, who want to, are actually uh, using such things, a recent work by uh, Panda, uh, for instance. So let's start with the NP version. The in distributed NP is actually a pretty uh, old notion, uh, uh, probably over 15 years, introduced by Korman, Kutten, and Peleg and uh, as proof labeling system. Here we have, a gr uh, let's say that the input is basically the network itself, the graph. We can also have other parts of the input, but we'll concentrate on, think of the, the graph itself, the network, the communication network itself as being the input. And so we have an input, we have a prover, and the prover talks to the uh, verifiers. The verifiers are the processors sitting at the nodes uh, of the network. And the prover, uh, so each node, uh, let's say, knows uh, its ID and its neighbor's uh, IDs. And as I said, perhaps also an additional input, but let's forget that for a minute. And the prover sends a short message to each one of the verifiers, a different one. Each verifier receives a different message from the prover. They exchange messages with the neighbors and decide to accept or reject. So we, uh, if this is the case, we say that the proof size is of size L. And what we want is completeness. If the graph, let's say, satisfies the property we're interested in, then they should all accept. And if it does not satisfy, then for any proof, at least one should reject, okay? So accept, uh, to accept all accept, to reject, it's enough that one rejects. You may pro uh, protest and say, hey, that's not enough. We want everyone to reject. Uh, but uh, actually, that would put some burden in terms of the, uh, the uh, diameter of the graph. It would be harder if we use the notion, a different notion of soundness it will be harder to, to, to get uh, finer results and it would obscure a lot of things. And also you could say, look, if at least one guy rejects and they know that the system, he will start a process that at the end of which will 
the system uh, will need to reboot or to do something and would uh, get a new, uh, uh, and, and everything will be okay at the end. Eventually, uh, everything uh, will be okay. Yeah, do you have a new question or the same one you had at the Simon's talk? <laughs> okay. Uh, you just, uh, in the slide before, there was uh, the connectedness problem. Could be. Could be. Could be. Connectedness problem, let's take it. It's unreasonable to say that soundness, it's enough that one will reject, you want at least one to reject in each component. Okay, so we'll basically assume that the network is connected in this talk also. Okay, I, got I don't think you have asked this before. <laughs> Carl? Uh, hopefully nothing except, well, connectedness, for instance. If it's not connected or m maybe I'll be able to prove the size to you. So if it's not connected and you know the number of, no, pardon? I'm wondering if you can do it in a way that hides the graph. Ah, that's also, that's a good question. But, uh, how can you do, we'll get to zero knowledge. I mean, it's in the title, but we'll get to zero knowledge at some point if the other title will allow me. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so a very simple example would be three coloring, right? Everyone here can give, uh, uh, if it's, uh, the graph is three colorable, the prover simply gives everyone their color and they're very, compare the colors with the neighbors and they're very happy if indeed it's three colorable. If it's not, then it's a little bit harder to, to show that it's not uh, three colorable. Okay, uh, so basically in this, uh, the way I've defined it, so uh, the way I've defined it, the prover can send, since I didn't put any lim computation limitations on the verifiers, let's say only communication, then if the prover sends the graph and they de uh, to all, the full graph to all the nodes, and they just make sure that they receive the same graph a as their neighbors, and then do the local computation themselves, then they can solve any problem that they wish. So everything you can do with n squared plus, let's say, the additional information. So the way I've defined it here, n squared is the, the worst uh, type of uh, result we, we can get. It's better to get, of course, linear, but even better to get logarithmic or sublogarithmic. Right? That's, uh, the, the, that's where we are at. I'm measuring... The way I've defined it so far, I'm measuring only a, a communication, only the size of the proof from the prover to the verifier, and the verifiers also are pretty silly. All the only thing they do is uh, exchange messages about their proofs to their neighbors. So you see your proof and the, your neighbor's proofs. Okay, so far nothing interactive here. And you can do all sorts of things, for instance, spanning tree. You can compute a spanning tree in this uh, uh, so it doesn't have to be a decision problem, it could also be a computation problem. So the prover can send to a node if uh, its parent's name in the tree and the distance from the root and uh, its own ID. And, the, and each node has to verify that the distance of, uh, that its distance from the root is its parent's distance plus one, or in case it's the root, it's the root. And uh, the ID of uh, R of uh, uh, among uh, the neighbor. So the proof would be uh, size, um, size login, okay? And uh, you don't need, uh, uh, so you, by sending login uh, pr uh, messages, you can uh, obtain a spanning tree. So that's very important because then later on we'll use the spanning tree for other things, yeah. That's a possibility, but there are lower bounds here. Uh, so I don't think there are lower bounds uh, in the, in, in the non-interactive in this case, and I don't think you can go uh, below, uh, you, you cannot be so, um, you, ha uh, you, you, ha you have a log and lower bound for this, so for deterministic. 
Okay, and in general, once you have a tree, you can do all sorts of things like summing up things, uh, summing up the tree. So you can count how many how many people, uh, how many nodes are in the tree, and they, or in the component, or in whatever. How many are red? How many are blue? You can do all sorts of things because you can sum up things, uh, sum up the tree, and you all the uh, only thing you have to do is a local computation. Make sure that uh, your sum is the sum of. Uh, your sum is whatever you have plus whatever your children in the tree have. So that's, a, again, a very powerful thing. And, and of course, and the root has to do the, uh, the actual verification that it's the correct sum. OK, so there's been quite a lot of work in this model in the, when you have a prover who simply sends a message to the uh, verifier, and there are quite a few results concerning the amount, the size of the proofs, and some things require n squared, some things require n, some things the logarithmic. Uh, some time ago, Cole Oshman and Saxena, uh, Gilad Cole and and um, Rotem and Rotem Oshman. And I forget Saxena's first name, even though I get email from him. I'm on some mailing list. Uh, generalized the NP to uh, interactive proof. So now the prover not only sends a single message, but each round he, a, 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 a node sends a random string to the prover, and the prover responds with a message. And they exchange the, uh, this information with their neighbors, and they repeat a couple of times. So distributed AM, they do it just once. And you can think of uh, doing it again and again and getting uh, uh, other uh, classes. So AM would be just a single time. You send a random message, you get a single proof, and then decide to accept or reject. And completeness, as before, we want with high probability all nodes to accept or always to accept if it's perfect completeness. And soundness, well, we simply want that with high probability or with certain probability related to, to L, something we can uh, play around with, uh, there will exist a node that uh, rejects. So it's enough that one node reject in order to consider the whole system as uh, rejecting. Okay, and as I said, you can generalize it to uh, any number of rounds and get results. You can even talk about uh, private coins, but almost everything I'll say in this talk would be with uh, public coins. Every, you need to redo everything. Everything you know about interactive proofs, you need to do. Oh, par but par simple parallel repetition here will, will uh, decrease. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Simple parallel, there, there isn't any issue with the simple. But in general, uh, you know, moving from private coins to public coins is not clear at all. Okay. And for instance, what Call It Al showed is uh, they show that you can do graph uh, non-isomorphism using n log n uh, communication. And remember, n log n is non-trivial, because n squared is sort of the trivial thing. And indeed, there is an omega of n squared lower bound without interaction by Gus and Sumela. They showed an n squared lower bound, and uh, Cole Oshman and Saxena showed an upper bound of uh, n log n. And they showed a lower bound in AM of uh, log n. Okay, log, you, need to, you must send the log n bits. Okay, so the graph isomorphism problem in this case Think of it as if some of your edges are considered one graph and some edges are considered the other graph, so they're colored and you have to figure out whether it's the, the graph, the two graphs defined are isomorphic or not. That would be one way of defining it. Another way, even tougher one, is to say I have a graph and, the la and I want to know whether it's isomorphic, let's say, to the hypercube. So the other graph is fixed. It doesn't correspond to the communication graph. Okay, so I want to show you that it's not isomorphic. That the input graph is not isomorphic to some fixed graph. That would be another possible way of phrasing. I mean, they're not equivalent these problems, or as far as we know. 
this is for, for both of them, yeah. yeah. These bounds. Okay. So what do we have? We have general compilers from translating standard interactive protocols with an efficient verifier to a protocol with a distributed verifier. And the transformations preserve the complexity of the prover. And uh, in particular, if you have an R round standard protocol for some language, then we, and the verifier runs in time t, then we have a distributed uh, protocol with R plus two rounds and a communication t over n log n. So it works best if the time is linear, then we get here log n the number of rounds of the standard pro protocol. So it could be just one, uh, zero, for instance, if it's a, a, it's interesting even if it's zero, if you have a, just a, a, an algorithm, think of, you, you have a graph, you want to know whether it's planar. So here you have a linear time algorithm for checking whether a given graph is um, linear, uh, planar, sorry, so uh, you, you have a, you want to know whether your graph is plain or not. You don't need a really approver for that, so you have a zero round pr uh, protocol for that. And uh, you, you get a, a two round protocol with a log n messages for that. If the verifier uses bounded space, then we get constant round log, log n and if it uses bounded depth, then we have to add polylog related to the depth and the polylog round. So this is a more a, a less efficient. And the protocols, as I mentioned, are public coins. And uh, so I'm mostly going to talk about this, uh, how to get, this is sort of, we use this in order to bootstrap the two other results, which if uh, you're into this sort of things, you can guess that they're based on RRR and GKR, the, these two results, bootstrapped by this result. Okay, so uh, what we do in this case, we simulate computation, and each node is going to be responsible for a small part of it, and we need to verify consistency between the different parts. So, uh, some other results we have, and one for the graph non-isomorphism problem, we have a, a logarithmic result. You need, uh, the amount of communication you need is logarithmic, and uh, as I mentioned, there is a lower bound, a logarithmic lower bound for two rounds for AM, but nothing about that. There are no actual lower bounds for AM, AM, and for deterministic, you'll need N squared. Uh, we, for some problems, we can go beneath, uh, they actually do not need logarithmic. You can actually solve problems like leader election and click. You can solve them in order one, a, a total amount of communication in MAMM uh, protocol. So, in fact, the challenge is to pr prove any sort of lower bound for AMAM. For any, for any problem. That's all. If you want to stop listening and start thinking, this is a, a good time. Anyway, okay. So let's start with, so I, I want to show you this result, more or less. Uh, so let's start with the set equality problem. So this is, I have two sets. So think of it as each node has two values, AU and BU. And uh, think of, and we want to compare the two sets, uh, A and B, A collection of the AUs, B the collection of BUs. We want to verify that they're equal as a multi-set. So this is, a, if you think of the problem is when they are somehow streamed to you, the two sets in some arbitrary ordering, you just need to verify that they are uh, the same, then this is, a, there is an algorithm suggested by Lipton, basically using Reed-Solomon code in a way that is invariant to the order and aggregating a hash function. 
So you basically think of one set as defining the polynomial uh, pi u uh, uh, x minus a u, and similarly the polynomial pb, which is all the elements in b, uh, the, the, the product of all the elements x minus b for the elements uh, in the, the set b. And these two polynomials are the same if and only if the two sets are the same as a, as a multiset. And now to verify that two polynomials are the same, you pick a random point and compute it. And this is very convenient if you're doing it, um, let's say, if they are streamed to you, then it's a very th uh, simple thing to you to do. Now we have to do it. We want to do this thing in, in our setting. Uh, and basically what the prover needs to do is needs to build a tree with the root r. R is going to sample the point S, the random point S, send it to the prover. The prover sends to each node the values of the children, the product of the values. We remember summing up the, the tree. Now you're, what we're going to do is we're, well, product, do a product of the tree, basically the same. So you do it with the, with the children. He also needs to send them S, and they need to verify that he's sending them the correct S. You have to do some local computation to verify the consistency of what you're getting and what you are uh, sending. And uh, then, of course, the, the root has to make sure that the two sets he received are uh, the same set. So this shows that we can do it in communication log N. Well, the way I've presented it here is MAM but you can actually get it down to AM. Okay, so, pardon? One point is enough. Well, I mean, if you want a better probability, you'll need to send, uh, I mean, you'll get probability roughly proportional to the, your field size. If you want better, you'll need to send more points, have a larger fee, whatever uh, you need to do. But a point will give you something at least. Okay, so this is the protocol for set equality. How, what, how is it related to what I promised you, that they can do any computation? Let's do another problem, that's permutation. I want to decide whether this, I, I'm giving each uh, uh, processor gets a value, and the question is, think of it as an ID. And the question is, did everyone get a unique ID, or is this set a permutation of the elements one through n? Is the set of values that they receive the same as one through n? Well, the, there is a simple reduction to set equality. You simply define BU as AU plus one mod N. And uh, now you have to compare the two sets. So if you can do set equality, you can also check whether you have a permutation or not. So again, we get that you can check whether you have a permutation in, in logarithmic communication. And this is already something useful. I mentioned, for instance, the work of PAMDAT that he, he, that's exactly the type of thing he, he wanted to verify there. Now we want a, gener a general compiler. Uh, well, the prover has to assign IDs between one and N, and then simulate whatever the original protocol is by distributing the messages and the work among the N nodes. So if a, pro a processor received a I, IDI, there is the slice i of the original protocol that that processor is responsible for. Okay, that's very important. Because we can verify permutation, it's clear what each processor should be doing. Processor i should be doing slice i of the work. So you know what you're supposed to do. The question is, does, is what you're doing really related to what the other guys are doing? Right, so, say, so let's say node u is, sends challenge ru and gets response mu. Uh, and v is the final computation of the verifier. Now you have to v magically verify that indeed you're going to accept. And the major issue is verifying that the nodes received indeed consistent inputs. So let's say you were supposed, no, maybe you, you were supposed to do just computation. Take three values and add them up. Three values from arbitrary locations in the memory and add them up and do something with it. 
That's what, that was your job as processor 55. So you have to verify that the, what you, the values that the prover gave you as what's sitting in the memory in those locations are indeed what was sitting in the memory in those locations. You don't have access to a common memory. We're simulating this common memory in this uh, work. So if it's a circuit, for instance, if somehow the verifier is implemented by a circuit, so we have some circuit here, then pr the prover sends a node i the values of the wires of gate number i, and uh, w is the set of input wires, w prime is the set of output wires, and the nodes have to verify, uh, let's say gate, uh, that ga in gate gi, w equals whatever your, your, he gets as an input is consistent with what he's supposed to get as an output. So it really becomes a set equality protocol. So if what they're doing, the computation they're doing is a circuit, then it translates to set equality where the amount of work or the amount of communication each uh, uh, processor gets is proportional to the size of the circuit over n. Uh, Okay, so this is what we get here. But <laughs> we are working in a graph, not working in a circuit, and uh, I promised you a RAM, not a circuit. I mean, there may be a large difference between RAM complexity and circuit complexity. So really, if we think of it, we get the problem when we have a RAM that runs in time t is really like the problem of memory checking uh, first considered in, uh, in Bl by Blum et al. And there, the issue was, so you have a, an unreliable, you have an unreliable uh, memory, and you want to make sure that when you're accessing a certain location, it's what was supposed to be there, meaning it was the value that was written there by the previous operation. And you don't have, you have some secrecy, but not a lot. So in, in, in that model, you do have a, like a secure processor as in ORAM. Here, we don't really have a secure processor, but what we do have is the future. The one who's giving the values doesn't know the future yet. So uh, the future is secret in this uh, respect. So what uh, we do, uh, think of that the graph is in memory. The graph is in memory, and we have to verify locally that indeed, if I claim that a certain edge exists, then somebody has to write their own edge there or something uh, like that. And uh, what we can do using uh, this work is take any RAM, on, if, we think of a, if we think of a centralized processor where the graph is already in memory, we can simulate any work that takes time t using proof size t over n times log n. Okay, so for sparse graphs, for sparse graphs, as in planar, the claim is that this, the input graph is planar. We can do it using a logarithmic amount of proofs. We can prove that the input graph is uh, planar because the planar graph, of course, has only a linear number of edges. Uh, we can use, do it using, uh, and, and verifying it takes linear time. We can do it using uh, lo logarithmic size proofs. Okay. So basically, it's a, the reduction is, if you know that work, the reduction, uh, the Blum et al. work, then the reduction is b exactly the same. You, the only thing is that what you have to write in memory is the value of, it, at each location you have to write the value. The sort of the, in, the element you have in the memory is the value, A, the address, and the timestamp. It's important. The only thing you have to verify online, on the fly, is that when you're, ri when you're reading at, uh, uh, something mem from memory, that the timestamp there is not larger than the current time. As long as you verify that this is the case, then you have done a reduction to, as long as this, this is never violated, so this is something deterministic that you can check, then you have reduced, you, you can show that you can reduce the problem to set equality, and then use the previous algorithm that we saw. So we can verify any computation of size t 
using uh, t over n um, times log n uh, bits. Once we have this, we can do lots of other things. Remember, our sort of big thing is n squared. So w oftentimes, we'll shrink the problem to be of linear size and then run this thing. So uh, in particular, uh, we can run the RRR the RRR, the uh, uh, Rangel, Rothman, Rothblum, they showed a, an interactive proof where you can do, you can do anything computable in bounded space, you have an interactive proof which is uh, efficient, which is constant number of rounds, and we can simulate the verifier in this case uh, and without, uh, without significant cost. And GKR, Goldwasser, Kalai, and Rothblum showed this uh, similar, I mean, for bounded depth, uh, NC circuits, but here the cost is polylogarithmic, and the proof size is also polylogarithmic. And it's not clear, so I'll tell you one problem that this one does that I, I, we don't know how to do here, and that's uh, distance type things, for instance, diameter. What is the diameter of uh, the graph? Um, so, so where, so this, uh, so the RAM compiler allows us to bootstrap to bootstrap these uh, other two uh, compilers, and the main point is that in both of them we have a final round that you actually touch the input using computing a point in a low degree extension of the input, in both of them you have such things, and in both of them you can do this computation using s pushing stuff up the tree. So each node has to do, to look, remember the problem may be that the graph is dense, maybe some nodes have a very high degree, so uh, the, the, each node is responsible for the low degree extension around itself, and you push up those re and you push those results up the tree. Yeah. Uh, you mean the low degree extension? No. No, the prover has to do whatever the prover does the, in the standard. You have the, the outer, the proof by pushing follow, but then at the end you want to push the memory, right? Yes. So in this step, can you also leverage the prover for that? Yes, of course, of course the prover should be, yeah. The prover is leveraged for that part, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise it wouldn't work, otherwise, because you don't. Yes, absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, you do compose these two uh, compilers, so to speak. <coughs> okay, let's see. Uh, how much time do I have? Twelve minutes. Hmm? Twenty? How, mu how much time? Twelve minutes. Oh, twelve minutes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so maybe le let me say a few words about the graph no uh, isomorphism, non-isomorphism. Uh, so actually, let's do a different problem, and that's the no-automorphism problem, which in the sort of centralized world, they're equivalent. Here, they're not equivalent, because as we said, as uh, uh, answering Edo's question, there are two variants of, of the graph isomorphism. So to simplify things, let's talk about the automorphism problem. So my goal is to convince you that the graph has no non-trivial automorphism. So that means that each, if it has no automorphism, then if we look at all the graphs which are isomorphic to it, then there are n factorial different graphs. As, as, as a, we look, at, if you view them as a, in the adjacency matrix. If there is an automorphism, then there are at most of size n squared over two, and now, <laughs> this was exactly what was exploited by Goldreich, Mikhail, Wigderson in the original, and if you, and then by the work of Goldwasser, Sipser, uh, to get rid of, to move, to switch from private coins into public coins. 
essentially what you need to do is you, you have to come up with a hash function uh, from, let's say, graphs from uh, JSONC matrices into n squared and into a, a, a space of size n factorial, and the prover has to send the verifier a hash function so that it, a, um, a, the, pr the verifier chooses a hash function and the prover sends a, a graph such that H, a, a graph isomorphic to the original one such that h of g prime is zero. That's how the original compiled proof looks like. Compiled proofs, I mean, if you use the Gold versus Simpson compiler on GMW. Not, com not comp unrelated to the compiler I showed before. So, right, so that's the main thing. Now, we don't, remember, we don't have, we have n factorial versus n factorial over 2, so we can't miss a lot of things. If we, and the, the, the function h has to be close to, has to be something like pairwise independent. Uh, in the distributed version, well, we can use the RAM compiler, and if we run it, we, re we get, we recreate the result of call et al. If we simply run our compiler on the uh, Gold versus Sipser uh, protocol. And, uh, and we want to do better, we want to get to something logarithmic, so the, amount, the proof would be logarithmic. And what we want is a hash function that can be computed at linear time. That's impossible. Linear as opposed to n squared. The graph may be of size n squared. So you cannot hope to compute it in linear time. And we want a hash function that can be computed locally. It's also impossible locally because it cannot be pairwise independent if you compute it locally. Uh, but <laughs> so what we'll have is you use a hash function that can be computed partially locally and partially in linear time. Uh, so we'll go from n squared to 2n log n using a local function g that hardly misses any, there are hardly any collisions in it. And from here to here, we'll use a pairwise independent hash function. And here, so here we are back to our compiler. And luckily for us, Ishai Kushilevitz, Ostrovsky, and Sahai suggested a pairwise independent hash function that runs in linear time. So we can use our compiler and, com and do the second part. And for the first part, we'll do something. We'll use many little seeds and uh, compute things locally. Now, we, it would not be exactly, it would not be a pairwise independent, but we would not get many collisions. That's the important thing, because we cannot afford many collisions here. So we get, using that, we get, we get the logarithmic uh, type of result. Um, I'm going to skip this, how to get be below the uh, sublogarithmic world. Ah, no, but this is something I want to tell because I promised something in the title. Okay, everything I said at the beginning sounded as if I am against interaction because we said we want to do the proof once and for all. So that doesn't quite square with uh, having an interactive prover. And indeed, we can ask... Let's get back to a non-interactive uh, prover. And we also want the prover to be efficient, of course. And all our provers are efficient except the one of, in the graph non-isomorphism one. So in principle, if, since it's efficient, it could be implemented by the network. And we want to do the proof once, ma uh, verify many times. And uh, to get rid of interaction, the price, of course, is to move from proofs to arguments and uh, get a non-interactive uh, and get a non-interactive argument so let's assume that we also have random oracles perhaps i mean a good question is how to do it without random oracles because here we do have some sort of this is related to jens's result we it reduces to the problem of the network coming up with a common reference string if you want to get rid of the random oracle. But everything I'll say assumes that we have a random oracle. So essentially, the challenge, the reason why it's not in, uh, in, uh, entirely straightforward is that we need to apply the random oracle in a distributed system. So it's not clear. We need to hash, let's say, the full graph. That's already non-trivial. And remember that the adversary, being adversary, may choose a tree 
any tree it wishes. So we either have to so we have to argue either that our thing works with any spanning tree, or that the adversary is forced to choose a lexicographically first spanning tree. So he doesn't have uh, much choice in that. But using that, we can get that any problem in P has an argument labeling system. We can get, instead of proof labeling system, argument labeling system on length proportional to the security parameters times the polylog, assuming we have a, a random oracle. OK. Um, we can also talk about zero knowledge, uh, which I forget who raised this question before. So let's say you can think of zero knowledge in several ways. I think Tal was very ambitious. She, she doesn't even want you to know anything about the graph. But perhaps we want to do zero knowledge in a more traditional manner. So right, so there are two, two variants of zero knowledge you can think of. One is that you learn hardly learn anything about the graph. The other is that you hardly, given the graph, you hardly learn anything about other uh, stuff that you shouldn't know. Uh, what I'm saying, uh, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, about the second one. And what one thing you can do is use FHE. You can use FHE, and the prover sends all the messages that are encrypted. The nodes perform local computation homomorphically. The nodes, at the end, the nodes hold an encryption of a single bit output, let's say accept, reject, whatever. The prover runs a zero knowledge protocol with each node separately proving that the encrypted bit is zero. So essentially using FHE, you can get any sort of uh, protocol, you can translate any sort of protocol into a zero knowledge protocol where the communication is not much larger than uh, the original one. But this is not the way to do it probably or a natural question is do you really need FHE in this case because we have interaction we have all sorts of other things can you do things uh, that are uh, more natural uh, that are more natural so let me conclude with uh, some uh, uh, open question is one is how to how do you get lower bounds in this model as I said anything super constant with a constant number of, with four rounds is already interesting uh, or on the other hand, perhaps you can argue that it will be hard because it would, it would imply proving lower bounds on some complexity classes. Uh, another is, does, sh does, shared private, does shared private randomness help at all? We didn't talk at all about, uh, random, about private coins, but let's say if they have shared private randomness, can you do better things? So the result about NC, so we can do NC in polylog, polylog, and, and, uh, and we said we can do also bounded space. But, so I think that an interesting question is things like distances I'm giving you, or either diameter or I'm giving you for every node, I'm telling, uh, I'm giving you a bunch of uh, N pairs of nodes, compute all the distances, or convince me that the distances between these pairs of nodes is the claimed one. Think of, um, Think of ways proving to you that you're doing the right, uh, that everyone is indeed routing themselves using the, the correct, the, the shortest path. And as I mentioned, uh, how can you get zero knowledge with a weaker assumption? Thank you. <laughs>